So we're going to be talking about the economic effects of the COVID uh, crisis um, from a few different perspectives. Uh, Dr. Gail Dawson from UTC, who teaches business management um, and uh, has been a senior consultant at Price Waterhouse and has also worked for General Motors, has uh, her perspective from uh, academia in the business world and also the practical point of view. Uh, we also have Dr. Les Petrovic, who is a clinical psychologist and a family psychoeducator, who's going to talk about uh, some of the deeper impacts on our uh, collective psyche and also from the individual perspective. And uh, John Miles, who um, I've known since before, right before I moved to Chattanooga, because uh, he made me a really a good a pasta dinner, or at least served <laughs> a good pasta dinner when I first uh, started looking for houses here. And, it's a pleasure to meet him then, and, and glad to have him here now, John. And uh, you are the manager at Provinos. Yes. Theory. And so uh, you have a unique perspective on that point of view as well. So thank you for our speakers for being here. Thank you for being here to, to listen. And uh, I look forward to just a really enlightening dialogue. And uh, Deborah, thank you. Pleasure. Absolutely. Um, this topic on the economics of COVID uh, for us uh, is today's topic because so many of us are affected. Uh, there are stores and shops having to operate differently, restaurants, hotels, and vacation spots suffering huge losses, and all of them facing a winter surge in cases. And some have lost jobs. Others cannot travel for their work as they used to. Many women have opted to leave jobs to homeschool. And this unprecedented economic situation has different results in our communities, but it's creating stress on us all and an unwieldy challenge for the upcoming generation. So given the importance of economic issues today, the theme of today's dialogue is also the theme of this month's issue of the American Diversity Report. The recording of this session will be available on the ADR, as well as additional articles by experts on this topic. If you're not already subscribed, please sign up for a free monthly newsletter. Your views, your articles, and comments are always welcome. And I turn this over now to John Miles, an owner of one of these stores, to share what's happening with him. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, thank you for asking me to speak, and it's good to see people. I wish we could see each other in person. Uh, as far as the per perspective of Provinos here in Chattanooga, uh, we were closed for nine weeks. Uh, just prior to that closing, business went down to almost zero, and then we decided to close we opened back up May 26th. Uh, before COVID, we had uh, about 70 employees. We now have about 50. Uh, uh, our business has gone from just uh, full blown, every day, busy, busy, busy. Uh, we're now running about uh, three quarters of that, 75%. Uh, our takeout business uh, beforehand was five to eight percent of our volume. Now it's uh, 15 to 25 percent. Uh, we are following the uh, rules from the CDC and Hamilton County Health Department. Our tables cannot be closer than six feet apart. Uh, we wash and sanitize every table, every chair between customers. Uh, we take each employee's temperature as they walk in. We have had a few employees, uh, one in particular who has gotten uh, COVID. Uh, in fact, today is his first day back at work or for, after 14 days of being out. Hey, John, John, I yes. want to interrupt for just one second. I want to go ahead and just click mute all, and I didn't want to cut you off in the middle of speaking, which I'm worried it would mute you. I'm going to click mute, and then I'll open up. You can uh, unmute yourself after that and right. continue. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. Okay, John, you should be able to go ahead and unmute.
There you go. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, folks. I just wanted to make sure that we cut out some of the background noise. All right. Uh, but we are running about 75% of our normal volume. Uh, and we've lost a lot of employees. Uh, as far as we're concerned, a lot of our, we still have a lot of people coming in from about a two hour radius of Chattanooga. Uh, but our business has been hurt. Uh, I noticed when I go out to other restaurants, they operate in a similar fashion uh, to us. Uh, a lot of places have totally changed. A lot of places are out of business. It's, it's really too bad. Uh, but uh, I don't know if you can say that the strong survive. Uh, a lot of restaurants are strong, but during this situation, they haven't been able to uh, survive. Uh, but we're doing what we can. We're following the rules. Are there any questions or is there anything particular that y'all would like uh, to hear? Yes, John. What is your business? What is your business? It's uh, an Italian restaurant mm. on okay, uh, thanks. South Terrace in Chattanooga. John Provino, Provino's Italian restaurant. Thanks. Has that movie theater reopened and how do you think that affects the traffic on that in that shopping center? Affected? I think it has reopened, but uh, they're very limited. There's just a few cars out there. Whereas before there were hundreds and we had a symbiotic relationship with them. Uh, but I don't think that exist at this point. How, how did you decide which employees to let go? That must have been very difficult, especially for long time employees. Uh, actually, uh, it kind of worked itself out. Uh, the long, most of the long term employees are still there. We have several employees been there 20, 25 years. Uh, I've been there uh, I don't know, 35, 36 years. The restaurant's in its 37th year. And uh, we have several employees, great employees who've been there a long, long time. And, you know, they've been extremely supportive through thick and thin. Um, I'm relatively new to the area, so I don't know exactly where you're located. Um, I'm curious um, if you've been able to um, has it helped with takeout business or I'm curious if you've been able to pivot to create any outdoor space where people could be eating outside and since I don't know your location I can't I don't know your landscape but I'm curious yeah. about things like that uh, we are at the intersection of interstate 24 and 75 on, on South Terrace uh, we can't really have people eat outside uh, it's right next to the interstates, too much noise. Uh, and I would assume standing outside too long, a lot of fumes from the highway and such, not very pleasant for eating. But our takeout has increased from uh, uh, five to 8% of our volume to 15 to 25%. Uh, it's, uh, takeout is great. Uh, we can take the food out to the cars. Uh, we don't really allow people to gather in our lobby uh, because of the uh, uh, restrictions put on us. But we do take the food out to uh, the automobiles. Uh, people call up and order ahead of time. And when they arrive, uh, they call a specific number and we'll take the food out to them. And uh, that, that's increased uh, three or four uh, fold. So the takeout is uh, just fabulous. Uh, have you tried any uh, home delivery model? No, we don't. We do not do home delivery. Although there are some food well, delivery listen. companies that pick the food up. Have you tried? Home delivery? John. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi, Helen. How are you? Nice I'm to great. see you. You know, I'm glad to hear that you're at least seventy-five percent functioning. Yes. Because a lot yes. of people can say that. Um, we have been there when uh, your wait staff stood in line to have you check 
uh, driver's licenses for people who are celebrating birthdays because I yes. know you always give a free meal to someone and that's a way of bringing in others. Has that, is there some way you can tie that in with enhancing your carry out business even more? I don't know, but it's just, that's one of the things that makes you so special is the fact that people always want to mark their birthday at yes. your place. Thank you, Helen. Uh, we are doing the uh, birthdays on our takeout food. Wonderful, thank you. I wonder if, if we could hear uh, from Leslie uh, uh, now about the effect of all of this and our stress. Um, you're doing a wonderful job there, John. I, just amazing, but I'm sure that it's stressful. A and so I wondered if we could address that. And Leslie, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the app opportunity. I'm having terrible, terrible echoing in here. Can anybody give give it, uh, advice how to stop that? The echoing. It doesn't echo here, so go ahead. You might okay. want to take off your earphones. Can you hear without your earphones? No, I can't. I have to have the earphones. Well, this is better now. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Good. Thanks. Uh, I'm located in Hungary, and maybe there's some value in a uh, in the lessons that Hungary has learned from its massive unemployment during privatization in the 90s where uh, we had an uh, unemployment rate of 40 percent that lasted from 1991 to 1999. Uh, the stress was unbelievable. It was with people who had never before been unemployed and had never written a resume and uh, had, in fact, unemployment was illegal uh, in the old system under communism. Uh, so it came as a terrible shock and, and really produced what has to be described, at least from the European view, as, as a massive death by uh, stress-related stress illnesses um, and uh, uh, it resulted in several major problems. One was that many families fell apart and those who were the main victims of this is called death by despair. Chronic unemployment were males from age 35 to 55, really the caregivers. Uh, and it was an unfortunately rationalized in various ways at that time. Well, you guys were uh, chose poor lifestyles. You went to the bar or you became chronic smokers and this is what caused your, uh, uh, your narrowing of the arteries, your heart attacks, your stroke, your various other stress-related illnesses uh, which were uh, ulcers uh, uh, and largely circulatory illnesses. Again, this is a post-communist picture and I do not think in any ways it will happen in such a severe extent in the U.S. where by 1999 uh, close to 400,000 breadwinners, caregivers, the men 35 to 55 died. Uh, it was, it's something that we cannot talk about yet. 
And this, for me, touches upon a theme that is close to my work. It's a psychoanalytic concept called uh, return of the repressed. When we cannot look at our history, when we cannot talk about what happened in the past, uh, it tends to repeat itself. We, in the changes early on, were not allowed to look at our past at what I call the graveyards of the tyrant. This is a metaphor, it's not literal graveyards, but we were not allowed to look at the, the Soviet tyranny. We were not allowed to look at the graveyard of the 1956 revolution, nor the Hungarian Holocaust, nor World War II. It's essential for us to look at these things relevant to our discussion. I knew next to nothing of the black history. And it came to me as a shock in recent, just recent years, that our forefathers were also slaveholders. It's, I'm not a dumb person. I had a fairly good education. But this was a big hole uh, in my understanding of my friends, friends that I cared about, people that who added to my life. Um, and the, that number, for close to 400,000, replicates, is close in the, if we talk of the banality of numbers, just banal numbers, it is close to the losses of the Hungarian Holocaust. We can't even get close to talking about this genocide proportion of losses during democratization. Now, I had been asked to, to, be, to suggest some policy changes, some suggestions as to what might offset the tragedies facing the U.S. And again, I try to use the Hungarian example of the mistakes made. There were no support systems back then at all. There was no, no whatever, uh, none. You have those support systems to some degree. I would hope that there would be a massive investment of funds that has been talked about or suggested. I don't know if that will be actualized, but I, I feel from distant shores, great need for some sort of New Deal type of big help at a time when there's great, great crisis and the potential crisis being needed for change, something positive in my hope, the, a movement towards actualizing a successful third reconstruction, something that's real and uh, related to that, uh, the, this is something that, uh, that William talked about. Finances are needed for healthcare. So I really hope that, that that big sum of money will come. The second major thing, and the Hungarians have learned this, policy, policy. At that time, it was, it was Jeffrey Sachs's policy. Very, very cruel. He made jokes about what was going on here. That, oh, I gave that region a, you know, electoral shock. Quick, quick change, quick shock. Now, please, if you have seen anybody who has been treated with electoral shock, you know what they look like. And that's literally what it looked like on the ground here. His colleagues, whom I knew well, 
who were running the World Bank here said, in essence, try to correct it. They said, well, we cut off a leg with a buzz saw, and it's gonna leave an ugly and lasting scar. Absolutely correct. The region-wide entire region is authoritarian. That's the scar, it's dictatorships all over. And by 1993, nearly all of the population was yearning for an iron fist. This, I suggest, is also part of what the Rust Belt is about in the U.S. The yearning for someone different is going to be the iron fist. And uh, that's, uh, that's uh, what we learned in terms of policy. You, you should have what's called anthropology of policy, something that's open and re-examined repeatedly for mistakes. Thank you. Are we going in the right direction or not? Absolutely, so. absolutely. Re-examine, make sure that we are on the right path, make sure that the policies are correct, and, and see what the response is on people's mental health. We are, all of us are, are, are concerned, I know, and thank you. And you know, one of the things that I worry about the most is our young people, what are they inheriting? What are they going to be doing and how are they faring? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow up with you a little bit later, but ask Gail Dawson to talk to us about what is happening with this generation and how she is preparing young people to do business in this wild, crazy time that we have, whether we get that reconstruction or not. So Gail, why don't you take it from here and let us know what's going on with you and your students. Okay, well I want to first uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, I wanted to start, start with COVID-19's effect on business. I mean, we've all seen many businesses closing. We've seen unprecedented uh, disruptions in the workforce. We've seen people shifting to working remotely where they can. Um, over the first six months, we saw 60 million uh, Americans filing for unemployment. The most hardly hit were the um, travel, tourism, hospitality type, type industries where a lot of furloughs and um, job losses occurred. If we look specifically at Chattanooga, back in April, the Chattanooga Times Free Press reported that 60% um, of the businesses that responded to the Chamber of Commerce survey said that they had lost over half of their revenue due to COVID-19. At that time, about half of them expected to be closed for about five to eight weeks, and about 43% expected to be closed for nine weeks. So now we see months later, some of the other effects that have happened, and we're still seeing um, businesses struggling. We're seeing uh, people losing jobs, we've seen the high unemployment. When we look at the effect that COVID-19 has had on college students, um, Arizona State University did a survey and um, they found that 13% of the students who responded to the, the survey said they were delaying their graduations. 40% of them lost jobs, internships, or job offers. The lower income students were 55% more likely to delay their graduations. COVID-19 nearly doubled the gap between the lower income and the higher income students' GPAs. Um, Non-white students were 70% more likely to change their majors. And first-generation students were 50% more likely to um, delay their graduations than students who had parents who had college educations. In a Temple University study of more than 38,000 students, 58% um, said they were having difficulty making, um, meeting their basic needs. 71% of black students said that they had basic need insecurity. 52% of white students said they had uh, basic need insecurity. And about a third of the students who had jobs said they lost their jobs to uh, the pandemic. When we look at the effect on the mental health, um, Active Minds did a study 
and they said that 80% of college students reported that COVID-19 had affected their mental health. One in five of the students said that their mental health was significantly worsened. 91% um, said that they were experiencing stress or anxiety. 80% said that they were experiencing disappointment and sadness. And 80% said that they were experiencing loneliness and isolation. So it is really having a, a significant impact on our students. I can say that um, at UTC, our first priority with COVID was to make sure that we were protecting our students, their health and their safety. So in the spring, we um, extended spring break for an extra week. We shifted to online classes to finish out that semester. In the summer and fall, we had a mixture of face-to-face -face classes with social distancing, uh, masks, and cleaning protocols to try to keep everybody safe. But we also had some hybrid classes and some classes that were totally online, either synchronous or asynchronous. So some of the classes were being conducted through um, things like Zoom or we have uh, Canvas and Kaltura. I, I'm personally using Kaltura to do our classes. Um, some of them are asynchronous classes, so they're just posting things out there and you know, with the help of discussion boards and other things, connecting with the students. Um, the university, as well as the College of Business specifically, has held some virtual events so that students could connect a little bit more with their faculty, with student organizations, and with other students so that we can address some of the issues of feeling of loneliness and isolation. The uh, Rollins College of Business and their Student Success Center has done some outreach to employers in the area where they um, actually did videos of employers discussing how they anticipated the uh, COVID-19 would, would impact their recruiting efforts. And they made those available to students. They've hosted virtual career fairs so students could discuss the impact with the, with the potential employers. This fall, we had the Student Success Center held information ses sessions with the students and um, provided videos on best practices for um, online networking, for virtual interviewing. And we're really trying to make sure that the students can at least go out, reach out there and do things online to connect with potential employers and to um, increase their chances of getting jobs. What the Success Center has seen has been um, a, brief, a brief lag in internships and job openings, but they're starting to see some opportunities open up now. So that's hopeful. Overall, I think the college business has done a great job in providing for the safety of our students, for their continued education through a lot of different mechanisms, and really helping students to um, be flexible and have the resiliency to face whatever uncertain times are coming because we really don't know what the future is going to bring. We just need to make sure that our students have those kind of skills so that they can adapt and adjust and continue their success. I know that um, I've had quite a few sessions with my students on um, not only during class, but Zoom sessions personally with students to um, help reassure them that we're going to make this make through, make it through all of this together and that we just have to keep going and prepare for whatever life is going to bring. Wow. Go for you. Go you. I'm glad that they have you to talk to and uh, I'm sorry that the, it is such a difficult challenge. And well, it's a difficult challenge. And one of the problems though, is that a lot of students, I mean, we have some students who are on campus. We have some students who are at home. We have students who are great distances away because, you know, staying with their families and that kind of thing. So there have been a lot of challenges with technology. Uh, in fact, um, my house was one of the houses hit with a tornado, so I'm staying with some friends and I've had some difficulties with their Wi-Fi not being as reliable as it should be sometimes. And um, my students have been really patient and sometimes I'm on a, a session with them and everything will just kind of fade out for a while. So we've been doing a lot of things to try to make sure we're getting the information out there. Um, and it's an adjustment for everybody. But the problem is that some of the students are not taking advantage of the opportunities. They're not reaching out. I mean, pretty much every class, I'm begging students, set up a Zoom session with me. Let me talk you through what's going on. And we can look at your grades and we can find out how we can get you what you need in order to you know, continue to progress. But some students are not taking advantage of it. Um, and there's only so much that you can do, really. Why do you think they're not taking advantage of it? 
I, you know, some of it, um, I guess is with students, sometimes they don't want to reach out. They don't want to admit that they need help with things. And I guess it's that, that way with everybody. I, I know sometimes I have difficulty saying, hey, I need help. And I think that's really what's going on with some of the students. Um, I, I was really kind of disappointed. I noticed last week that one of my students dropped the class and he was one of the students that really had a, um, he was in a lot better shape than some of the other students. And if he had just reached out and talked to me, I could have let him know exactly what he needed to do to get what he needs to get. But um, you can't force people to reach out, unfortunately. <laughs> So there's a question that uh, about financial aid and student loans. What's happening there? Um, well, we have been able to use the CARES funds to try to help students um, to keep things going. Um, as far as financial aid, I'm not really sure what's going with financial aid, but I know that the CARES funds have helped students with some of their basic needs so that they can you know, pay some of the bills and continue in their education. Um, I suspect that there are some students um, who have either dropped classes or um, are not dropping classes because of the effect that it would have on their financial aid. But I'm not really a part of the whole financial aid situation, so I'm not sure exactly what's going on with that. Thank you. I know the university is trying to um, help support the students as much as they can with the funding that they have, as well as you know, the CARES Act and other things that they may be able to put together to reach out to students and help with some of the financial issues. Thank you, thank you. I think there is a, a question from a raised hand here. <laughs> and um, if you would put your questions in the chat room, everybody, that would be easiest. Thank you, please do. And I'm sure people have comments and questions for you and Leslie and uh, John and, and in this incredible time. Are you expecting that the COVID will get worse in the next few months as it gets colder? And what are you gonna do? Is that a question for me or is that a question for the group? Sure, go for it. We'll ask the others too. Well, some of the things that the university <laughs> Mute your. Thank you. Okay. Some of the things that the university has done to try to um, kind of get a handle on that is that they rearranged the schedule for this fall. So we eliminated fall break. Um, we actually did teach class on Labor Day. Um, we condensed some things so that we will actually finish up the face to face portions of our class or the actually in class portions of our class by Thanksgiving with the idea that students are going to go home for Thanksgiving. We don't know what they're going to encounter, encounter when they go home. So we don't want them to bring some things back to campus. So once they leave for Thanksgiving, classes are officially over at that point and all finals are going to be online. Okay. So we don't want them to go home, you know, perhaps encounter people and get infected and bring it back to campus. So we're just kind of leaving at, um, at Thanksgiving, um, finals will continue after Thanksgiving into the beginning of December. However, all finals are gonna be online. Um, for the spring, we do expect also to have a combination of face-to-face -face classes, hybrid classes, and online classes, either synchronous or asynchronous classes. Um, they've delayed the beginning of, of the semester. We were originally scheduled to start on, I believe it was January 5th or 6th. We've pushed that back so that we don't actually start classes until after the Martin Luther King holiday. Um, I think the plan right now is we will not have a spring break, but we will go straight through and, you know, so that there won't be as much temptation to leave and go somewhere else where you could potentially get the virus and bring it back to campus. They are doing contact tracing when we have students who um, have been exposed or who actually have the virus. So they are um, keeping tabs of who they are in contact with and making sure they're contacting everybody. Um, I can't even tell you the number of students that I've gotten um, emails on about being in isolation or uh, quarantined and that kind of stuff. One young man I actually had a Zoom session with uh, on Thursday. And um, I feel really bad for him because not only is he quarantined, but he has COVID 
and he has strep throat. So, I mean, we're seeing a lot of those kind of things and it's remarkable how the students can go through that and still um, focus on classes and those kind of things. Wow. So uh, there, it looks like uh, Deborah Dubo has a, a question. It's really more of a comment um, because okay. I wanted to applaud UTC. My husband is a professor there in the business school as well. He has um, gone through what you have described, but what is amazing is the UTC behaviors. I do wanna reinforce and emphasize that not only has their enrollment, even though it's dropped like all the schools, the business school enrollment is down, I think what only five or 10%, which is amazing considering the other schools in the, in the country have a much, much bigger un enrollment that has gone down. And the idea of this contact tracing, my husband like you gets notified every day. He has students come and go. He's doing the hybrid model very challenging, Zoom in the room, microphones don't always work, people in the class, people in and out. But what's amazing is the resiliency of everyone and the adaptability and the flexibility. And um, he's actually pleased that everyone's gonna just come to the room next year, <laughs> next semester, but it will be smaller. So I'm amazed at UTC and what they've done compared to other schools in the country. So I applaud the school and keeping everyone safe and just on it, the contract tracing has been amazing. Wow. Leslie, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Uh, yeah, I too wanted to praise the resilience that I'm hearing and also point to the counter view from Hungary that is trauma. Trauma is in the air. Uh, trauma certainly hit Hungary. The reaction was very different. That is, there was a turning inward that you see in many of your students, an inability to ask. And on a broader societal level, there was a great injury to the body politic. One third of Hungarians today cannot name a single friend. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> Thank you. Not name okay. a single friend. And I see outside, yeah, a supportive friend outside of the family. You know, yeah, someone you might call, I have I have to go to the pharmacy, I might have a fever. Judy, can you drop by, pick up my prescriptions? Nothing. Nothing. Yes, it's called uh, social cohesion. A lot of it has been injured permanently, seemingly long term. I see in the chat room uh, that um, from uh, uh, Eleonora that about college students doing and having that same exact problem here. Uh, they don't have the friends and they don't have the contacts and they feel lost. And there's going to be a lot of feeling lost here for a while. How do we in our different communities deal with this feeling of, of isolation and, and, and not having that social cohesion that you mentioned, Les? What do, what do we do? I mean, it's one thing for our students and we take care of them. How are we taking care of ourselves? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Anybody want to chime in on that? I can say for the students, um, they have a lot, of, they've had a lot of events on campus. Um, the director of housing actually had me do, um, I choreographed line dances. So I did a Zoom session with some of the, the students in residence on line dancing just to kind of get them together and give prizes for them to connect and those kind of things. Uh, that's great. Um, so, I mean, just trying to find a way that we can get some connections where we can. Uh, uh -huh. for some of, uh, particularly the, the, the black faculty and staff, we've had uh, kind of a virtual happy hour so that we could, number one, we're so spread out on campus that we don't even know each other, but we've had a virtual happy hour so that we can interact a little bit. Um, so, I mean, you have to find ways to create community 
virtually, even if you can't be there face to face. Thank you. You're a real hero, Gail, in my eyes. You are here. Maybe in one of our sessions, you can lead us through a, a line dance <laughs> together, <laughs> the Black Jewish Dialogue Line Dance. And she not only teaches it, but uh, she choreographs, so she could make it for us. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm curious, we're talking about with the economics overall, and I think, Gail, you're hoping maybe you're up to date on some of the business journals and things like that. As far as, uh, I've got, I guess, two-part question. One is like, so how do businesses or anybody just sort of like prepare and hedge against what we don't know? And then secondly, this is near and dear to me and probably several other people on this call too, but the nonprofits who, uh, I'll say right now, Mitzvah Congregation seems to be doing okay as far as uh, haven't been too strongly impacted, um, but we're also not sure what's going down the line. So I know there's a lot of anxiety as the effect trickles from the business world and they'll start coming back to the nonprofit world too. Is there any thoughts on that from, from what you know or anybody else who's in the business sector? Or is that just too big a question? <laughs> Unfortunately, with so much uncertainty, I have no idea how we're going to be able to uh, manage long term. I know that um, we do have a very um, active entrepreneurship program. So there are some people who are you know, trying to come up with new ideas, new businesses that they can launch, which is going to be kind of difficult in today's time as well. But um, in situations where you may not be able to get jobs with some of the bigger businesses because they are handled they're uh, experiencing some of the furloughs and and loss of jobs um, we do have a lot of students who have some very uh, entrepreneurial ideas and trying to help them to get those kind of businesses launched um, other than that i don't really know i would imagine startup capital is limited too yeah you know i think um the thing that's so interesting right now or challenging is the depending on the types of businesses you're in, some are doing quite well right now and some are doing horrible. So, I mean, obviously we know the restaurant and the travel industry sectors are really struggling. And then there are other sectors that are doing quite well. And so the challenge is to figure out, like you said, in the entrepreneurship world, what is what makes sense for the future and how do you look into the horizon and see where are we headed and what are the businesses that are going to thrive given? And so obviously like the online business community is going crazy and bananas, we all know, I mean, I don't even wanna mention Amazon, but that's quite out of control. But you know, the point is there, I mean, it, things like, you know, you can't, um, you can't get heaters outdoors right now. You can't order a heat lamp because everyone's ordering heat lamps. You can't, you know, there, if you think about what people want right now and need right now, you can't order outdoor things because people have been outdoors. So it's about thinking about as we move into the future, where are the opportunities that we can create entrepreneurial businesses where, where we're going? Of course, there's so much uncertainty and unknown. We don't know where our economy is going. We don't know what's next and how soon we'll have um, a response to COVID that's sustainable. The sooner we can solve COVID, like you said, Rabbi, then there's a chance. Um, but you know, we don't know how long it's going to take for vaccines. We don't know how soon we're going to have drugs that are really um, going to work well. So all those things put everything in uncertainty. But I think it is about thinking about what are the businesses and what are the even for nonprofits. What should we be working on that will make sense for what we need going forward? Yeah, I'm always fascinated, at least in my field of nonprofit, that uh, we can still have the same volume of service and that doesn't necessarily uh, equate to um, revenue. And, uh, you know, that's, that's an ongoing challenge. I'm sure Frank, who's the president currently, will agree with that, that our volume of service has been very consistent and steady, thank God. Um, and I think our revenue stream is being very consistent right now. Um, but uh, there's a lot of nerves right now too. 
Well, interestingly, it, it seems like our uh, attendance at services is probably higher virtually uh, because it's it's a little easier. Uh, uh, would, would you say that, Rabbi? Uh, in, in most ways, I'd say consistent because, you know, we're still missing the big programs like, you know, the first Friday dinners and things like that. And then the midweek, we're getting less traffic because just people don't want to do online classes as much as they would come to in-person things. So, but still, I guess on an, on an average volume, people get doing things that are connected to us. We're still strong. Um, so I, I think that's good, but right, as far as economic impact, uh, they don't necessarily equate, but the more people who feel engaged might be more, are more compelled to be supportive. Um, but it's also becomes discretionary income question when you're giving your, um, your nonprofit money. I'm just glad we don't have to pass the plate <laughs> in temple. That's, I think, honestly, that's why a lot of churches are hurting so much is that's, that's the revenue is that they pass the plate and that's not how our, our business model works. So we've actually been, um, in an okay situation because of that. I think the vulnerability here is clear. Um, even though we haven't necessarily experienced it yet, <laughs> we have definitely a, a, a sense of, of vulnerability in the future, in part because of COVID and part because of the economy, but also in part because uh, our younger people are unsure of the kind of revenue income they're going to have and what they are going to be able to contribute in the future to churches and synagogues and other nonprofits. Uh, it's, it's really going to be an interesting um, uh, <laughs> generational shift uh, and what it looks like, as Gail said, is unclear, uh, but we know that there will be uh, a shift as there always uh, it is. A and I'd like to, to add one, one thing to this. Um, my discussions with uh, corporations about hiring uh, has been, uh, a lot of them have not really done much. Uh, and in the terms of diversity, uh, they are not sure what to do and how to deal with it. The number of RFPs that I have gotten around diversity to restructure everything they're doing and how they're going to hire has been more in the past two months than in the past 10 years. Partly it's because they just don't know what to do, where to go, and some of them are nonprofits and some of them are corporations, but there's that sense of lost, being lost, what to do. Now it will perhaps improve uh, as we have a change at the top in the White House and the laws uh, that said uh, no diversity training is allowed in federal government agencies or in those that serve federal government agencies, those laws will, I think, disappear. And there's been a lot more discussion. I can tell on Facebook and in my emails about what next. Nobody quite knows, but the discussion is important that it actually exists, that we are discussing this, what to do, what we face. It's mm -hmm. incredible. Did someone want to chime in? Yeah, I want to reinforce that, that is in, the, in at times of uncertainty or at times of trauma, talk, 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 talk absolutely critical and it's the uh, when the issues become lost or pressed or repressed that's when you have problems so with, with you know with professors like uh, at the doctor named gail i think it's outstanding that they can talk about things and uh, so that's my input talk. I think some of the things that really do make a difference um, 
someone mentioned earlier engagement. And we really do need to think about how we can get people engaged in what's going on. I know with my students, I want, the, I want them to be engaged with the class. I want them to um, look at how they can build community, even if it's a virtual community, so that they don't feel so isolated, so that they can get their voices out there and feel that they belong here. That's one of the big things, especially for the freshman class coming in. College looks a lot different this year for freshmen coming in than it has in the past. And my concern is that they're not going to be able to connect and be engaged with the university and with their classmates that they may end up dropping out of school. Mm -hmm. Now, to, to give you a suggestion, I would put all of that into words. This is a time of crisis. This is a time of trauma. This is how you might want to react. Let's not do that. Turn to me or turn to a friend or here's Zoom, blah, blah. But be aware, this is how you might react. Does that make sense? Now, you're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Anyone else want to ask a question or make a comment? Uh, I do, but I don't know what happens in my picture. Um, Gail, I, hi, Gail. I wanted to know uh, if there were several students who had intended to begin the fall semester but opted to delay. Oh, my video. Okay. Yeah. Um, if the uh, number of acceptances exceeded the number of those who would normally uh, attend after having been accepted as freshmen? I don't think we saw much of a, a drop off of those who said they were intending to come. Once we uh, had to shift our, um, the way that we were presenting things, I don't think there was much of a drop off. I don't know, however, what's going to happen for next semester. After we've gone through a semester of this, I don't know what it's going to look like for next semester. I can tell you that um, I'm one of the uh, Tennessee Promise mentors and my mentee. Um, this is her first year here. She's um, a first generation college student. Mm -hmm. I've tried to get engage her in conversations and try to find out exactly where she is. And she's working a lot of hours and is not really even sure what she wants her major to be. She's right now she's a business major, but she's saying she may change her major. So I'm kind of encouraging her to explore some things and trying to get her to, um, I know financially she wants to be able to stay at home which is a little bit a ways from here. But um, if she does that, I have a feeling that she may drop out and not finish school. So I'm trying to engage her a little bit more. I'm trying mm -hmm. to send her to some of the career websites and trying to get her to think a little bit more broadly about what she wants to do instead of being in that mindset that so many college students unfortunately are in where they, um, they know that their parents want them to go to college, but they don't really have an idea of what they're going to college for. In my day, we went to college and we're not as concerned about where we were going to end up because we just wanted to college experience. <laughs> but things have changed so much now, you almost have to have a focus when you start. And I think that's to the detriment of a lot of students too. It should be a time of exploring options. It is a time of exploring options, but um, I think part of the problem is when you have absolutely no clue what you want to do and you go into a major and then you discover, well, this isn't what I want to do, that yeah. sometimes we lose the student instead of them taking the time to explore and find out what they want to do. Um, if they do at least have an idea of where they might want to end up and start exploring that earlier, they can kind of arrange their classes to lead to where they want to go, rather than getting to the end and then saying, well, I'm not sure what I do next. Do you run into many students whose financial situation is such that rather than begin college, they take a year off to see the world. I know. The gap we, year. The yeah, gap year. We we have a, our grandson is go, is senior in high school, and I don't know what they're going to do with him in terms of will he go to college right now or take a gap year. Do you well, run into that? Where I am uh, right now, I don't get students until they're in their junior year. 
Oh. So I really don't know. I teach juniors, seniors, and graduate students. Mm -hmm. okay. So a lot of times I don't see the people who are coming in. Uh, having this, uh, the, the mentor or the mentee right now, um, it's interesting for me because now I'm seeing somebody who's just coming in. You know, can I say something? Yeah. Sure. Um, is it okay? I, um, I, I think, you know, this all started about us talking to each other about our commonalities and looking for more ways of dialogue and thinking about all the students everywhere not only in high school but you know i was like i was trying to monitor my grandson this morning in sunday school and it's very difficult and our kids in college are expected to make dec career decisions over a four-year period and i don't i don't even think i started to grow up until i was 40. <laughs> I, you know it and I still think if, if we talk to everybody, you know, if there's a smile on our face, if we're kind, I had a very interesting conversation with one of my sanitation workers Friday. And it, uh, we were talking about the election and he said he couldn't vote because he was a felon. And I said, oh my goodness. And I said, well, I know a couple of good criminal attorneys because after you've served, you should be able to get your rights back. You know, it's all, but my having a conversation with this relatively young man was me trying to interact with someone who did have a job. And I was thinking to myself, thank goodness the city of Chattanooga is hiring because he hasn't been out of prison very long so that's just a comment are you are any of you familiar with everlena holmes is that a name that means anything to you yes yeah everlena has her finger on the pulse of an awful lot of what's going on in this city and every week she manages to accumulate scores of job opportunities that she shares online. So I don't have her email address handy, but maybe I can find it because it would be a, she does inundate you with an awful lot of information that's not employment re uh, related, but she really does have a wonderful kind of a storehouse of information about jobs all over the city, not just with, um, uh the government but with private industry as well so i'll take a look and before we end i'll give it to anybody who wants it okay ellen have you shared that in from i didn't that's first i'm hearing of it and it doesn't I'm sorry happen, rabbi what'd you say <clears throat> that's the first i'm hearing of this and sometimes people do call me to see if i have any leads which i don't but also jewish federation i don't know if uh because they would often get um call about a request like that you might want to share that list so I'll just forward it to you and to uh, her email to you and to Michael, and then they yeah. can get online and just be prepared to see more than you want to know about anything and everything that's going on in Chattanooga. But you can hone in on the things that are relevant. Okay. So I'll send it yep. to you. All right. I think Dr. Woods has a question. Thank you, Helen. Yeah, I want to make a comment about the young man that wanted to vote. Uh, many of you may know my work in the civil rights field in, in the city for a, quite a long time. Um, and I would love to present some information um, to you about how you get your rights restored. Uh, the first thing you can tell the young man is if he doesn't owe any things to the court, the only thing he has to do is to fill out a form. He can go in the district attorney's office, get that form, and let his... Um, probation officer sign off on it that he doesn't owe any debt and then um, take it back to the district attorney's office and then they will uh, allow him to get his rights restored once he takes that form down to the election commission office once it's signed off 
then the election commission office will take that form and they will certify that he doesn't owe anything back to the courts and then they will give him his rights to vote again. It's just that simple. Great. Thank you very much, Ellen. And I wonder if maybe uh, you and I might talk about uh, doing a, an article for the American Diversity Report uh, around civil rights, uh, maybe for the December issue, uh, making a difference around that. Um, would that Absolutely. Ab okay, let's, let's do that because I think that requires a lot more time than we have today. It's very important and I don't want to miss out on that. Uh, and, and maybe others have people who, maybe others of you would like to write and that would be great or have other people like your your contact Helen who might like to write also so that we have this in writing and up online uh, in, in, in a digestible way that we can share uh, across the more than 1,000 subscribers to the American Diversity Report. There is one issue that this a lady whose name I don't know who just spoke about her experiences um, alluded to and that is if you don't owe the court any money that's an enormous stumbling block for a lot of people. They have paid their debt, but they can't pay their, their monetary debts. And so that precludes them from participating in the democratic process. Is there any work being done on trying to eliminate that stumbling block for people to vote? Oh, I can't hear you. Your mute is on. Okay. I know to get the record as funds, there's been some funding, some grant funding to help assist uh, with the getting the expungement done. Uh, I'm not sure about the court fine because that is a, a policy that would require policy changes. When these young men and women come out of prison, they owe all kinds of money. They charge them for, uh, for I call it hotel stay in prison. They have to go out and pay for the time that they house in prison and then they also have to pay the court cost so it can be quite enormous um, and that that in my opinion is a voter suppression tactic uh, when you put those kinds when they, when they come out they can't get jobs easily and then you're expecting them to pay for something and they have no way to pay for it so that's something we can work on we can bring those kinds of issues to the forefront um, and if we make those kinds of changes, then we can surely, surely restore people's rights uh, without this financial burden that's attached to it. That's essential. It's only fair. Yeah. Thank you. Please add that to the article uh, and, and we'll put it up on, online so people have a very clear idea of what's involved and what you're trying to do. Thank you. We're coming uh, to the end of our session. Um, as I said, it will it is being recorded and it will be available, uh, at least in audio form or a link to it, uh, online in the American Diversity Report within the next week. Uh, and know that our next session is in December. I believe it's the 13th, the Sunday, second Sunday. At um, Deborah, we may have to well, we have a 5.30 Hanukkah program that we've scheduled for that night now. Okay. So uh, if we do it at four, it could work, but it's gonna run up against it's, that okay. event. And it's an in-person in the parking lot right. driving. So. Okay, well, let's talk about right. that then. Yeah, we need to talk about the date. All right, well, the, the, the topic of it will be, I'm not sure when, but the topic will be good works and repair of the world. Kuna Lum. Okay. Right. So, uh, well, yes. I was just going to wrap up. Say thank you again to uh, Dr. Watson and Leslie. Is it Dr. Petrovic, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Petrovic and to um, Dr. Miles. I'll just say that now, <laughs> John, for uh, for their enlightening presentations today. Thank you all for your great questions and insights. And uh, I, I really, I, I think that this group is becoming um, one of the, the real treasures, um, at, at least in my calendar each month. And I think something that has a lot of potential 
to do some good in our community and clearly uh, the world at this point because we have a global reach. So uh, if you know anybody who would uh, really uh, be interested in being a part of this Black Jewish dialogue and uh, talk about some real issues, uh, reach out and uh, we certainly are, are expanding our group as we continue to, to, to build bridges. So thank you. Hey, Rabbi, this is Bill Hicks. Um, hey, just Bill? Side, hey, hey, Bill. Information in the chat room about um, felons repatriation that people may find of interest. All right. Uh, let's. Sometimes these things disappear from the chat room once we close the meeting. So yeah. can you put it in an email too? Yeah, here. yeah, I'll send it to you. Okay. Thank you, Bill. That'd be great. Appreciate it. It's good to see some familiar faces, and it's it's pleasant to see some new faces. Appreciate you, John. Thank you. Thanks to all for participating. It's it's been a real pleasure for me. And uh, uh, thank you all for your input and the lively uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, friends. Thank you, guys. Look forward to hearing from you in emails, more information, comments. Um, yeah, articles. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Deborah. Have a great day, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank Next you, month. Thank you.